I like to say Bushy, and I haven't felt that the thought of this for years, Rick, but um, I had uh, Peace Corps friends from uh, 50 years ago visit last night. So when Rick went to Turkey with us, his name was Bombacı, which means the bomber in Turkish. <laughs> and, so, and it wasn't until we were leaving the country that the guy at customs in Turkey looked at me, looked at my name, and said, do you know what your name means in Turkish? <laughs> Somehow nobody else saw fit to mention that for three weeks. Yeah. At any rate, uh, Rick and I go back a long time. We had some wonderful times together figuring out my computer when he was in the computer business and, uh, and then um, uh, together at Fish Trap for several years in uh, what I consider the heyday or heyday there, right, Rick? And, uh, and then just good friendship all these years. But, uh, and then that three week trip to Turkey where Rick was able to come along and we took a, a bunch of Rotarians to Turkey for three weeks. Um, and Rick is a, I, those of you who don't know, he is an inveterate hiker and has probably put on more mile, miles on more pairs of shoes uh, than most of the rest of us combined. I don't, I don't know. Hammers might be might be getting one more on, two more on. Have it, Rick. Come much on. for the kind introduction, Rich. Um, yeah, Doug Hammerstrom and I were were uh, college hiking pals. Some of our early most significant experiences together up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, whose visitor levels probably dwarf the Eagle Cap by an order of magnitude as close as they are to all those big cities in New England. Anyway, uh, let's, let's get started. Thanks everybody for joining. And um, Rich asked me to um, share some thoughts about what I have seen change in the Eagle Cap wilderness this year and in the past few years. Just to go back to uh, county since 1980 and over the past 40 years, I've done a lot of hiking in both the Eagle Cap and Hell's Canyon wilderness areas. And off and on over the past 11 years, I've worked nine seasons as a wilderness ranger for the Forest Service. And people invariably ask, well, what do you do out there? I usually carry a shovel when I'm in that job. The other thing they like to ask is, what's the shovel for? Um, we can get into that later. But basically, the, the role of wilderness rangers is to educate visitors about best practices and regulations, to enforce those regulations, to pick up trash, help maintain trails, dismantle illegal fire rings and structures, do some restoration work on campsites uh, and address other impacts. And finally, to collect data. Um, we collect a lot of data and you're gonna see some of that data today. But I thought uh, what I would start with is, is what I think is a big gap in the current mindset of people who visit Wallowa County, and a lot of people in Wallowa County too, which is the Wilderness Act. Let's see, uh, Rich, you're going to have to enable screen, oh, wait a minute, yeah, you're going to have to enable screen sharing for me. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, so Cheryl has to do that. Okay. Um, I've run into a lot of people in the wilderness over the past few years, and I've taken to, among other things, asking them, especially if they're younger, whether they've ever heard of the Wilderness Act. And the answer has been almost invariably no. They have no idea what the Wilderness Act is. I was very aware of it as a young person. Uh, it was passed in 1964, I was nine years old then, and so it was recent enough legislation, I think that it was sort of in the public mind for a couple of decades after that. And um, 
screen share. Okay. For lack of screen sharing, I'm just going to read to you the, uh, a few excerpts. Quote, in order to ensure that an increasing population accompanied by expanding settlement and growing mechanization does not occupy and modify all areas within the United States, leaving no lands in their natural condition, it is hereby declared to be the policy of the Congress to secure for the American people of present and future generations the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. So a few of the key phrases there are natural condition, present and future generations, and enduring resource. Uh, those sorts of key phrases guide the Forest Service and other agencies like BLM and the Park Service who are responsible for administering uh, wilderness. Uh, it guides their management strategies. Another excerpt says, wilderness shall be administered for the use and enjoyment of the American people in such manner as will leave them unimpaired for future use and enjoyment as wilderness. And so as to provide for the protection of these areas, the preservation of their wilderness character. So those are some more key concepts. And finally, Rich, would you just give me a holler when screen sharing is enabled? Yeah, I will. She's trying, Cheryl's not here and Megan's trying to figure it out. So I'm so you, sorry. You basically go into settings and there's gonna be a settings for each meeting and you can turn it off and on there. Okay, I'll tell her. I can hear it. Oh. Okay, you got it? No. She's sharing her screen now. She needs to go into settings and let me share the screen. I now I don't know how to get back into my screen. There's a place where you can tell it to stop sharing, Megan. Okay. Well, now I have no idea where I am. What says you are? Stop sharing. Okay, the now. Other thing, uh, the other thing we could do is you could have sign off and log back in using your username and password as the host, and then I would be able to share screen. Can, can you tell me how I can share screen with you? Or that's not. That's not what we need. We need for me to be able to share my screen. Mm. Do you guys, do you guys mind if I take a time out here to help Megan with this issue? Yeah. Okay. So Megan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. So um, you are in a Zoom session right now. Right. And what we want to do is, and you are signed in as the administrator or as the host of this meeting, correct? Correct. All right, let me just check something here. One thing you might do is click on participants, which is an icon at the bottom of your screen. Yes. And then you should see a list of people, including me. Right and then uh, click on one of the little buttons on my name and see if there's a place there where you can enable screen sharing for me. Uh, it's giving me the options to make host. Yeah, why don't you try that? Okay, I think that did it. Thank you very much, Megan. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so you folks should all be able to see. Um, We're good. All right. So I've just, I've read those first two excerpts and just to review, the intent of the Wilderness Act of 1964 is to is to keep these areas in their natural condition for future generations so that they will endure 
for the future. And uh, the activities that we engage in there need to leave them unimpaired and preserve the wilderness character. And then this next paragraph is probably the most famous paragraph from the Wilderness Act, uh, especially this word untrammeled. A wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as, as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. Untrammeled does not mean untrampled, it means uncontrolled which basically means in this day and age that we need to be willing to refrain from exerting the sorts of control over wilderness areas that we have done over most of the rest of the surface of the planet. Uh, looking at the bold areas, wilderness is supposed to retain its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or habitation. The imprint of man's work is supposed to be substantially unnoticeable there should be outstanding opportunities for solitude, primitive and unconfined recreation, and has other values, including ecological, geological, or other features of scientific, educational, scenic, or historical value. So, uh, like most acts, it's many pages long, but that's the, that's the heart of it. And what's important to us there is that uh, there is a difference between wilderness with a small w and wilderness with a capital W. Wilderness with a capital W are these federally designated areas throughout the country where these specific goals apply and that guides the management of the agencies. The reason I'm bringing this up right now is because as I've mentioned most people seem to be completely ignorant of the existence of the Wilderness Act they don't know about the difference between capital W and, and small w, which means that they are not well informed about why the Forest Service does what it does, why it chooses to uh, implement the regulations that it does, and why it uses particular uh, practices, for example, using crosscut saws instead of chainsaws to maintain the trails. So I'm just gonna uh, run through a few of the key regulations here because that will inform some of the slides that follow. So first of all, let's remember that wilderness areas are not just about recreation. They're not just supposed to be a playground. There are these other values that they provide to us in the natural world, such as providing clean air and water and uh, allowing opportunities for scientific research and historic preservation. What's allowed? Foot travel, horseback travel, hunting are all allowed. Grazing is allowed, but only with a permit, as is the case for any private rancher who wants to graze on public land, they have to get a permit. No roads in wilderness, no motorized vehicles, including ATVs, motorcycles, dirt bikes, cars, you name it. No bicycles. No mechanized equipment of any kind, including chainsaws. No low-flying aircraft. No landings by aircraft. No drones. No structures. That's your basic collection of, of uh, features or activities that are prohibited. Specifically in the Eagle Cap in the Hell's Canyon wilderness here, so incidentally, we have these two wilderness areas which together comprise about a half a million acres. Um, and the Eagle Cap Wilderness is the most heavily visited wilderness east of the Cascades. So each forest gets to sort of fine tune their rules and regulations that apply to the wilderness area. So uh, here in the Eagle Cap and Hell's Canyon, there are group size limits. If you allow a huge group, then that has a negative impact on the, on the land and other people. We encourage leave no trace uh, practices, pack out all your garbage and so forth. We encourage people to camp on durable surfaces, which means on uh, established sites of rock, sand, or duff. We encourage people to camp away from water. hundred. We more than encourage, it's the it's the rule that you must camp at least 100 feet from lakes. No campfires are allowed within a quarter mile of certain lakes. Human waste should be buried 200 feet from lakes or any, any surface water. 
You're not supposed to cut any standing trees alive or dead. You're encouraged to use established fire rings where, where they are legal, and you're not supposed to cut switchbacks. So that's kind of a basic litany of these best practices and uh, rules to guide visitor behavior in order to provide that the wilderness area will be will endure and be here for present uh, gen uh, for future generations. Most pe those regulations are all on the back of the wilderness permit that you're supposed to get when you go into the wilderness. Ninety nine point nine percent of all people do not read the back of their wilderness permit. So many people are ignorant of those rules, and I would argue that many people are aware of them, but are very good at rationalizing why those rules should not apply to them. So that's the background, the, the, the Wilderness Act, um, as it applies to the Eagle Cap and Hell's Canyon. So Rich asked me what has changed here recently. And before we get to that, let's sort of look at a, a handful of pictures that remind us of the sort of postcard images we all have of wilderness as a place of beauty and inspiration. <coughs> and by the way, anyone who wants to pipe up at any time and interrupt, feel free. Rick, there's also a chat box, and I see Joe Whittle has posted something there, and people can do that as well. Okay. You've got some people in the waiting room, Rich. Pardon? Oh, they need to be let on? Uh, I just went ahead and, and, and uh, admitted them. Good. Okay, so here's, there are typically signs like this posted at any trail that enters either Hell's Canyon or Eagle Cap Wilderness. That lets you know that you're actually crossing the boundary into a federally designated area where these rules apply. Again, foot, foot travel is welcome, closed to motor vehicles and motorized equipment. People like to destroy these signs and they like to steal these signs. Okay, so what has changed? I'm gonna focus on the heart of the Eagle Cap Wilderness, which we call Lake Space, and most of you are familiar with that term. And here's Tupan at the head of the Losting River Road. And here's the head of Wallawa Lake. And here's the West Fork of the Wallawa and the Ice Lake. And here's Lake Space, the heart of Lake Space, and with Mirror Lake, Moccasin Lake, Douglas, Crescent, Horseshoe, and so forth. Here's Glacier Lake down here. This is Polaris Pass in here, which brings you over to Aneroid Lake on the East Fork of the Wallawa. So this whole general area is the most heavily used area in the wilderness. And if you ask me what has changed over the past few years, many of you probably have been up to Tupan and have figured out that if you want to park your car at Tupan, you may very well be parked almost a mile down the road by the Maxwell Lake Trailhead here, and you may have to walk half a mile to a mile just to get to the trailhead because the parking is no longer adequate for the number of people who park at Tupan. I've seen that happening over the past five years or so. Um, so that is a new, that's a relatively new development so there's a lot heavier use coming in through Tupan. Same thing at the head of the lake. Even in September, late September, uh, when I was up there, I had to park quite a ways down the road, uh, almost, to, uh, almost to the pack station there, and had to walk up the road to get to the trailhead. So visitation is definitely very heavy right now. And uh, that's been true for many wilderness areas across the West partly due to COVID, but I would say not purely because of COVID, because Tupan started getting crowded several years ago. It didn't all happen overnight. Um, so working for the Forest Service this summer, I did a four day trip to uh, patrol this heavily used area. 
I hiked up to Aneroid Lake and over Polaris Pass, past Glacier Lake, and went to Mirror and Moccasin, and, and then out. In, in four days, I ran into, without even trying, 250 people. Oh, my Lord. Um, and I talked to those people. I, I, that's part of my job. And I always ask where people are from, and I always ask where they're planning to go. And without exaggerating, I would say that 85 to 90 percent of the people I talked to were from the Portland area. Uh, and, it, and Portland's always been a, a heavy, heavily represented here in the Eagle Cap, but I would submit that that is a higher percentage than in the past. Um, those people were all, of course, doing essentially the same thing. They were mostly planning to camp at Mirror Lake. Uh, many of them were headed to Ice Lake. I'd say those two lakes are the most heavily visited and most heavily trashed lakes in the wilderness. Uh, and I want to give you a sense of what that looks like. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about what's driving that besides COVID is that you have uh, you have magazines like Backpacker that steer you to certain places. I just grabbed these in five minutes. It was no trouble finding this stuff. Big views, no crowds. They're going to send you to certain places. Here's Lose the Crowds, 147 Trip Skills and Products. Solitude near you. So uh, Backpacker Magazine and outdoor gear manufacturers basically are selling, they've monetized the concept of solitude, uh, which is part of the Wilderness Act. They're monetizing that, they're, in, they're selling people on the concept that you can go to this place, have your great escape, and experience solitude. But of course, because it's been published on the cover of the magazine, that's all a lie, because there's a million other people reading that same magazine and planning to go to that same place. And that is what Lake Basin is suffering from right now. Uh, I ran into Aaron Maxwell a couple days ago. Many of you know Aaron. He told me that in September he was on top of the Matterhorn and he's a trail runner. So he was able to run all the way back to the trailhead from the top of the Matterhorn in about three hours. And he happened to count and he said he counted 105 people. This is in three hours, he counted 105 people, including 40 people who looked like they were carrying backpacks down from Ice Lake. So 40 people were, at least 40 people were camped at Ice Lake the night before, uh, headed out to the trailhead. So we've got these magazines that are pushing people here. And by the way, a year or two ago, uh, in an issue like this, Hell's Canyon had a full page spread and Eagle Cap Wilderness had a two page spread of photos and recommendations and routes. So Backpacker was sending people here. Uh, another thing that is sending people here is that Three Sisters Wilderness, for example, near Bend, which also receives a lot of use, as you can imagine. They are in the process of implementing quotas in that wilderness area, at least in specific areas. So if you want to go backpacking in Three Sisters Wilderness, you um, can't just pack up and go. You need to find out if there's any space available and register if there is space. We haven't done that here, but what there's a, there's a domino effect. So you live in Bend, you want to go backpacking, you want to go to a certain area, but you find out that the quota has been exceeded. So you hunt around for someplace else to go where there's no quotas in effect. Oh, let's go to the Eagle Cap. It's a longer drive, but we, we don't have to wait in line. So that I think uh, is pushing people out to other areas. So first thing that's changed is more people. Another thing that's changed, and this is highly unscientific with a very small sample size, but my perception this year is that I felt like I was seeing a lot more groups that were all women. And uh, of the 
couples I spoke to, it seemed like very frequently the woman was the alpha partner. The woman was the person who engaged in conversation with me. The, the man sort of took a back seat. Maybe the man didn't know exactly where they were headed or where they were planning the camp, and the woman seemed to have all the information and have, uh, have everything figured out. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And one thing you'll notice in a lot of these screenshots I'm including here from different magazines and whatnot, they generally feature women. And so, you know, it's a chicken or egg kind of thing. Are, is Backpacker featuring women in these articles and photos in response to a changing demographic or are they encouraging that change or, or, or what's the correlation? Another change that I see, which also is uh, highly unscientific, is I think that we're seeing people go to fewer destinations and therefore have a greater impact. Of all those people parked up at Tupan, in years past, I would have wagered that perhaps 60% of them were headed to Mirror Lake, and the other 40% were headed off to different places you can get to from the Tupan trailhead. Whereas today, I would be willing to bet that a much higher percentage, perhaps 80 or 90% of those people, are headed straight to Mirror Lake. That means you've got a smaller and smaller number of places in the wilderness that are absorbing a higher and higher number of visitors and the resulting impacts. I told you the Forest Service collects data. Well, all these little triangles are campsites. They're not designated campsites. They're not official campsites. They are simply places where wilderness rangers have observed impact on the ground, which could be as little as a little fire ring, or it could be a huge 3,000 square foot bare, barren area that's been worn down to dirt by repeated use. So that's what Ice Lake looks like. Here's what Mirror Lake and Moccasin Lake look like in Upper Lake. See all the yellow triangles and purple and black and blue? All those triangles are sites of impact, places where the ground has been affected by people visiting. I like to compare this concentration of people or focus of people on a small proportion of total destinations to the music industry, where it's a, I think of it as a pyramid that uh, goes like this. You've got a whole bunch of musicians who are very, very good and don't have much, much mind share in the public imagination. And then you've got a very small number of superstars who are known the world over. The same thing is true in film uh, or other sorts of entertainment. So we have a very small number of lakes that have achieved fame and therefore are magnets for people from all over whereas there are other places that are very nice to visit that receive less and less attention. So we end up with the proliferation of places like this. Okay, this, sites like this are inventoried by the Forest Service and every five years so that we can determine uh, how bad things are getting <laughs> and how quickly they're getting worse. But these are typical campsites. You have many, many square yards of bare ground. There are approximately 3,000 known campsites in the Eagle Cap Wilderness that have some degree of impact like this. And that's just the ones we've actually found. And as you can see here, um, many of these sites are right on the edge of lakes, which the Forest Service sees as problematic because one of the things, one of the values that wilderness has for us and for the natural world is uh, as sources of pure water. And the more topsoil that has been destroyed, the more vegetation near lakes, the more sediment you end up with in lakes and water quality declines. And water in Lakes Basin is the water that people in Joseph drink because it ends up going down the Wallawa River into Wallawa Lake. 
So it seems like this are very, very common. Big bear campsites right on the edge of lakes. They are illegal. That's why the Forest Service has a 100 foot setback from lakes. They are honored in the breach. People have no hesitation to camp right on the edge of lakes. Okay, now we're gonna get into some of my favorite peeves here. So another change that's taking place, what have I talked about? There's more people, the demographics are changing, people are going to fewer destinations. Another change is you're seeing more and more high-tech equipment uh, with the resulting impacts. I never saw so many hammocks in my life as I saw in Lakes Basin this year. It seems like everybody wants to have a hammock in addition to their tent. And they're marketed. This is the way they're marketed. These are marketing photographs. Pitch your hammock with a view of a majestic mountain near the lake. And they tend to be in bright colors. So I have a theory that the use of hammocks is actually degrading the wilderness experience for other visitors, and I'll explain to you why. And that's, that's one of the values that the Forest Service is attempting to preserve. They want people to be able to go into the wilderness and um, imagine that they're um, having a solitary experience, which means that the more people who congregate in one place, the more they actually have to uh, honor each other and respect each other and try to make themselves inconspicuous so that we can all indulge in this fantasy that we're out there alone. So here's, here's a typical scenario. You've got a Forest Service trail, and here's a campsite ringed by trees. And this trail here is what the Forest Service calls a social trail. It's an unofficial trail that people made just by using the same path over and over again. So you've got a little social trail that goes to a campsite with a campfire ring. Here's where they pitch their tents, and they're more or less hidden from view, sort of, because people are seeking that solitude. And then here's your secret lake that was featured on the cover of Backpacker magazine. And now a million people go there. All right, this is what hammocks have done to the situation. You need trees to hang your hammock. So people hang their hammocks in those trees that provided a visual barrier to the, to the tents. Now you're walking by on the trail up here and here's a bright orange hammock three feet away from you. Or you're on the other side of the lake and you look across the lake and you can see a bright, brightly covered, covered ha a hammock right here that's pitched on the edge of the lake. So the use of hammocks is having a visual impact on other users for sure. There were dozens of hammocks pitched at, at, um, at Mirror Lake. Why? I can think of better things to spend two pounds of weight on than a hammock but they are very much the rage right now so that you can conspicuously consume your leisure time in the wilderness. We also have a, a uh, increasing problem with drones. I had to shoo off a guy with a drone at Blue Hole. People were swimming and this person was flying a drone right up and down this, the uh, Imnaha River, more or less at head height. He knew it was wrong when I, when I, um, confronted him, he knew that what he was doing was not supposed to be happening. Here's another element. This red mark on this map is not a Forest Service trail. It's the path that someone walked in order to get from Ice Lake to Lakes Basin by traveling cross country. And with their GPS, they were able to create a track log, which they then showed on a map, which they then posted on the internet. And I presume that you could, if you wanted to actually get the GPX file from this person, which means you could put this route directly onto your GPS, which means that you could follow the exact route that this person traveled without any, having any sort of route finding skills. You just hold your GPS and you follow the line as you walk through the hills. That's rampant these days 
there basically are no secrets left in the wilderness. There are no secret places because people go someplace and they uh, GPS everything. They take photos and publish the coordinates of where the photo was taken. They take a hike. They give you every single little detail about their hike so that they can enhance their own status and encourage others to do the same thing. Any of you who have been up Thorpe Creek, which was once little known, you have to ford the Ford Hurricane Creek to get there. The trail used to be very, very faint. Uh, it's now a well-worn trail up into Thorpe Creek Basin because people want to go climb Sacagawea. And you no longer need to have a map reading skill um, or a sense of adventure to do that. You just need to plug the coordinates into your GPS and follow the dotted line. Another element of this that has sort of struck me and, and bothers me uh, is this sort of um, recreational imperialism, I called it. So I'm working up at Ice Lake. There's dozens of people camp there. And here comes this group of three twins. They're all in their 40s. Late in the day, the guy is kind of demented. He's got this demented look on his face, and he's charging into the out onto the peninsula at Ice Lake, and they're scouting for campsites, and I'm trying to get his attention, and he's spraying bug dope in his face, which gets in my lungs. And, you know, they came up from California because they had access to websites that say, here's where there's smoke and here's where there isn't smoke across the West. So now people can go to websites and they can say, I'm going to cherry pick. I'm going to go to this spot, which does not have wildfire smoke. And here's a route that I'm going to follow that I've got all the GPS coordinates and all the information I need to do it. And th these people came here and he was talking about this Bosterson Gap and Raspberry Mountain. And I'm, I've lived here for 40 years and I said, nobody around here calls anything by those names. So it's this sort of, it's this geographic imperialism where these people from outside the area, some guy, you know, posts something on the internet and because of the viral nature of social media, it becomes commonly accepted. So some guy climbed this unnamed peak and named it Raspberry Mountain. And now people have it in their mind that this place is called Raspberry Mountain. And it gave me a little bit of greater appreciation for native peoples who saw their places being invaded by strangers who had lacked any history or sensitivity to the importance of local places and gave those places their own names. That's, that's happening now because of social media. Here's, a, here's the Garmin website. You know, you're encouraged now to take high technology into the wilderness with you. And the implication is that if you don't, you're either not with it or you are unnecessarily endangering yourself and others. So you have this access to a, a global network. You can send an interactive SOS if you get into trouble. You can text anybody anywhere, no matter where you are in the wilderness because it's satellite based. So you could be in a completely inaccessible place and text your spouse at home in Kansas and ask them you know, what they're cooking for dinner that night. You can track your, your location, you can share your location, you can get updated weather reports. It basically, a lot of the mystery and unknowns that used to be part and parcel of a wilderness experience have gone away if you choose. You can choose to avail yourself of technology that completely changes the nature of a quote, wilderness experience. I would submit that that is counter to the intent of the Wilderness Act, which specifically mentions a primitive type of recreation. And I don't know what this is, but it is not primitive. Another trend is that the actual resource, quote unquote, the land itself, is degrading more and more. Uh, you can see that in the old signs that are not being kept up by the Forest Service. You can see it in increasingly brushy trails. 
there is a very specific reason this is poison ivy. <laughs> Uh, there's a specific reason for the increasing brushiness, in my opinion, in the eagle cap. We know that we are in an era of increasingly common and large wildfires. What happens after a fire? The canopy's been the tree canopy's been opened up, and so um, more sunlight reaches the forest floor, and you end up with a lot of brush. Ceanothus, uh, uh, blackberries. Uh, nine bark, all sorts of brush grows up. And brush is extremely labor intensive to, to cut out. Uh, I've done the calculation and uh, it would take a crew of many people several weeks to just brush the first few miles of the Amnaha River Trail, which now has a lot of Cyanothus encroaching on it because of the fires that happened there a couple decades ago. So the Forest Service cannot keep up with all the brushing out that needs to happen. Here's a trail that, that has captured a stream. In other words, the stream flows down the trail at certain times of year because the Forest Service does not have the capacity to keep up with trail maintenance requirements. We've all seen this sort of thing. That looks pretty um, minor there, but that sort of thing eventually turns into this sort of thing where you end up with these deeply rutted trails and you can see how they're using trekking poles here to help you visualize the volume of soil that has come out of that trench. Multiply that times miles and miles. And it, that, that is widespread throughout the Eagle Cap wilderness. In Hell's Canyon, the, the issue is a little bit different. The issue in Hell's Canyon is more that trails are disappearing. Momo says hi. Whoops. Well, we'll leave, we'll leave this guy on the screen for the moment. I, I've got this um, little theory that there's this vicious cycle occurring. I, I mentioned earlier how I think use is getting more and more concentrated in fewer and fewer places. I think that is a, a positive feedback loop with Forest Service maintenance priorities. The Forest Service is going to prioritize maintenance of trails that are receiving the heaviest use. People are going to hike to those places that are best maintained, where the trails are best maintained, and they are going to avoid going to those places where the trails are not so well maintained. And so those two behaviors feed into one another. And that is one reason why more and more people are going to fewer and fewer areas because the Forest Service is able to maintain fewer and fewer of the trails. There are 1,200 miles of trails in Eagle Cap and Hell's Canyon. That's a lot of miles and the Forest Service simply does not have the capacity to keep up with that. Uh, many of you know I'm involved with this Volunteer Trails Association. Great group of folks. We do a lot of good work. But even uh, our work isn't enough to tip that balance. Uh, in a good year, the Trails Association will clear no more than um, 100 to 200 miles of trail. We've never gotten to 200. We've done maybe 125 is the most we've ever done in a single season. I think that number may possibly climb a little bit, but you'd probably have to get to a total of four or 500 miles of trail cleared every year to actually keep up with stuff. So we've got this, this uh, vicious cycle going on. Now, anyone want to yell out who they think this is? Come on, Ed, you were probably alive when he was around. <laughs> Fess Parker. Well, uh, yeah, I think you're right, but who was Fess Parker playing? Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone. Okay, so I have this other theory, and um, I call it the Daniel Boone effect. Daniel Boone, the opening of the wilderness. Here, here's my theory. My theory, because I've shown you some degradation of trails, and I've shown you some bare areas, but if you really want to start getting into the ugly belly of the beast, we need to talk about campfires and trash. And uh, we see campfires in highly 
unsuitable places throughout the wilderness. You see a lot of fires in alpine and subalpine terrain. What, well, the definition of alpine and subalpine is that there's not a lot of trees around, right? And what trees are there tend to be small and stunted, and they take a very, very long time to grow just a little bit because the weather conditions are so harsh at those higher elevations. But what we've got going on is the conflation or confusion uh, of two different sort of mythologies at work in the United States. And one is the Daniel Boone opening of the wilderness with your hatchet. You're a woodsman, you can build a log cabin, you chop down trees, you build a campfire, so forth and so on. The other significant mythology is the Sierra Club calendar. And we should all recognize this photo. Sierra Club and other organizations have these beautiful, beautiful photographs of alpine terrain. And we are all educated that these are places we should consider beautiful. And these are the places where we should go for outdoor recreation. There are other areas that have also gained that sort of esteem, like an old growth forest with a beautiful waterfall, et cetera. But Alpine mountain country is sort of the quintessential wilderness area. So what do people want to do? They want to go to the quintessential Alpine mountain area, and they want to play Daniel Boone. And that is why people go to Ice Lake and they build campfires, which has resulted in the peninsula at Ice Lake being essentially completely denuded and full of cut off branches that are, or limbs that are four or six inches in diameter because all the small woody material has already been burnt up by previous generations. So this conflation, this confusion of these two mythologies, the, the Alpine wilderness and the Daniel Boone ethos of backcountry skills has created a real problem in alpine terrain. You know, how much firewood is there to burn here? Or here? But people build their fire rings in alpine meadows. They build big fires. They build lots and lots of fires. When you come right down to it, a lot of these fire rings are just ugly blights on the landscape, especially when people start throwing huge chunks of wood into them. So you see lots and lots of fire rings with huge unburned chunks of wood. Why are they burning huge chunks of wood? The little stuff's already been burned up. Many of these fire rings you're looking at are completely illegal and rangers like me will by hand completely dismantle them and try to make the area look as natural as possible as a way of discouraging people from building fire rings. But as I said, people like to rationalize and these rings get, many of them get built over and over again. It's a Sisyphean task. Not only that, but Fires are trash magnets. So almost every fire has garbage <coughs> in it. These are, these are the easy ones. There's a bunch of tin foil. The first time I saw this, I was morally outraged. Anyone want to take a guess what that turquoise stuff is? Huh. Looks like a hammock, Rick. It looks like a. Looks like a what? It looks like a tarp. You are right, Lori. We very frequently will see campfire rings in which people have taken those big blue tarps that you use to cover firewood with, and they burn them in these fire pits. They create these toxic waste sites by burning tarps, which coat the rocks with the plastic and I'm sure puts all sort of toxic stuff in the air. That's very common. And of course, we have a problem with poop. Now, we find stuff like this all the time. These are 
what you find at horse camps or hunter camps where they are using stock to carry things in. Backpackers just leave their toilet paper and their poop sitting around on the ground. And by all accounts, the poop problem uh, was much worse this summer, not only here, but also across the West at many wilderness areas, which would indicate that a fair number of the people coming into wilderness this year were, were somewhat ignorant or lazy or rude or evil. Uh, the, this little peninsula here at Ice Lake, the most popular place for people to camp, it is covered in little toilet paper blossoms. People poop on the ground, they wipe themselves with toilet paper and they stick a rock on top of it and the toilet paper sticks out. What do you think that's doing for water quality in Ice Lake? What do you think that's doing for the experience of other people? It's a rampant problem. This peninsula is only maybe 300 feet wide at the widest. So anybody who's going to camp out there and is going to poop responsibly needs to walk up the mountainside about 200 yards. And most people don't take the trouble to do that. A little house in the big woods, another sort of, I guess you'd call this a meme. But you know, I've been focusing on backpackers, but you also have your large hunting camps or horse camps. And these people <clears throat> oftentimes build camps that look like this. Here's a camp that I cleaned up. Jesus. On a per capita basis, these people uh, create a lot more damage and leave a lot more waste than your average backpacker. The backpackers make up for that in volume. You know, the problem at Mirror Lake is not that any one party is leaving a pile like this. The problem is that there are so many people going there. But this is just a handful of photos that I picked out of a library of hundreds of photos that we have used to document trash that we've cleaned up in the wilderness. Some of it doesn't get cleaned up. Some of it is still sitting out there waiting to get packed out. You'll notice that these large camps use a lot of wood poles. You're not supposed to cut standing trees, but it happens all the time. And they stash their poles for later use, which of course means that you are cutting trees. You're also using a chainsaw more often than not. Uh, even though they're illegal in order to build up your stash of firewood so you can have your big white man fire. So this is the sort of ethos that we as a culture are bringing to the wilderness um, in our ignorance and our disregard. Another question I often ask people is, and we're just about out of time, I'm going to try and wrap this up in another five or 10 minutes. And then those of you who want to stay on, I'm happy to stay a while longer. Uh, thank you for your patience. Another question I frequently ask people is whether they know what leave no trace means. Most people say yes, but the only behavior they associate with leave no trace is to pack out your garbage. And I think most backpackers have sort of gotten that. The other types of backcountry users, not so much. We still find lots of mountain house food bags, tin foil, beer cans, and so forth that have been left in campfire rings. But there are actually seven principles of no trace, and I'll just run through them briefly. Plan, whoops, plan ahead and prepare. In other words, if you plan ahead, you're less likely to find yourself in a difficult situation where you can justify, oh, I'm, I have to build a campfire here because I got soaking wet in the rain and I don't have any spare clothes with me, that sort of thing. So plan ahead and be prepared. Travel and camp on durable surfaces. 
yes, we want people to camp on bare ground, but not if it's less than 100 feet from the lake. Dispose of waste properly, that's pretty self-evident. Leave what you find. Minimize campfire impacts. Don't build a giant campfire. Use an existing fire ring rather than building a new one 10 feet away. You can't believe how many campsites have multiple fire rings within 20 feet of each other. It's like people want to live in a pigsty. I don't get it. Respect wildlife. And the last one here at the bottom, be considerate of other visitors. So those are the seven principles of Leave No Trace. There's a whole organization dedicated to promulgating those principles. My issue with Leave No Trace is that um, it does not go far enough. In this country, unlike in Europe, we've created this sort of dichotomy. We've got these designated wilderness areas where we've got a whole set of values and behaviors that we want people to manifest. And a lot of those behaviors and values are pretty much at odds with the other 99% of what we do and how we live. So I think it's unrealistic to expect a person who's used to generating a lot of trash in their day-to-day -day life and consuming a lot in their day-to-day -day life and ma making a lot of noise in their day-to-day -day life and expect them to sort of turn all that off when they go into the wilderness and be in essence a different person. And I think our mistake as a culture has been to not make an attempt to inculcate or, or teach a leave no trace, small footprint kind of mentality in the larger culture. You know, we should be living in smaller houses. We should having, be having less impact on the natural world, not just in wilderness, but at home. I'm gonna uh, go ahead and end here with just a couple more thoughts. I have more stuff on my little outline, but uh, we've run out of time. I just think we have this huge disconnect between the intent of the Wilderness Act and the way we behave and the, the uh, ignorance that we bring with us into the wilderness. People, I don't, many, many people do not really go into wilderness seeking a wilderness experience. They're, they're seeking a recreational experience that may or may not have anything to do with wilderness values. They're wearing little light running shoes. They're carrying a lightweight pack. They're carrying high technology. They can get away with carrying not much in the way of additional clothing because they can get up to the up to the minute weather reports. They have an expectation that all the trails have been manicured for their use. So they're not dressed, they're not prepared to, to deal with wilderness in a true sense. They're going for a walk in the park. I think so. I think there's a there's a real disconnect between um, what's going on in our brains and what's happening out there in the world. I want to end with this photo. Uh, I'll show you a, a couple nice ones at the end, but this is the last photo I want to show you of impacts. This was a camp I visited this summer. I saw these five gallon tubs from DNB Supply up on the hillside, and when I got up there, there were a bunch of cans and bottles scattered all over the place. And all these buckets had been smashed in on the sides. So anyone want to take a guess what caused this? Mm. Douglas Hammerstrom went like this. Yeah. Those were all smashed in by a bear. We don't have a big bear problem in the Eagle Cap, but in, that, in the area where this camp is, there is somewhat of a problem. These five gallon buckets had been cached by someone for later use and the bear broke into them and opened up the cans and bottles. But the amazing thing to me about this particular site is that most of the empty bottles, right here is one, you know what they were? I called this, you know, I have this habit of naming camps. Eight or eight. And, and this camp I called Newcastle Camp. And for any of you who have heard the phrase bringing coal to 
the new castle will have maybe a hint of what this bottle is. Water bottle? There were about 20 or 25 bottles of Dasani water. These people had packed 40 pounds of bottled water into the wilderness. They deserve to have their camp destroyed by a bear because they are living on the planet Pluto. It's just absurd. So, anyway, here's, here's a few more photos of the natural world that I presume we all love. And if anyone wants to, to uh, chime, I'll stop screen sharing and anyone who wants to sort of chime in, feel free. Well, Rick, I want to thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation and it should be widely distributed and we're going to make sure that it is, I hope. Um, are there any, does anybody have a particular question or a comment they want to make now? Please mute yourself unless you are talking. Thanks. Go ahead, Rick, you call on people. I don't see that anyone is volunteering to talk. Well, there's there's uh, been a very Mary lively- Kay. Oh. Mary Kay, go ahead. You need to unmute yourself, Mary Kay. I'm trying, I just hit the wrong button. So thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful. I have mom here listening to the whole thing. Hello, Ann. <laughs> I can visualize some of the things that Anders is doing. Yes. It's his work. Yeah, and uh, let's see now. This is a grandson. Anders was one of my coworkers this summer, and he got a good taste of the sorts of things. Uh, in fact, he was in one of the photos. He got a good taste of that. Well, thank you. There's been a real, there's been a lively conversation going on in the chat line. And uh, so people can, who haven't looked at that, please down at the bottom of the screen, you can go to chat. Um, there's been a conversation, a kind of a sub conversation at the Wilderness Act did not take note of the fact that indigenous people were, were in fact living on this land and using this land. And as Joe Whittle remarked, he's, He's picked up arrowheads in the wilderness, meaning that people were there, of course. Sure, there's no doubt about that. And that's a, t that's a point I meant to touch on a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, you could call it a failing of the Wilderness Act. It reflected the thought of the times. Uh, people distinguished between the natural world and the human manipulated world. And, and since then, I think there's been a realization on the part of everybody uh, that the landscape that Europeans found when they came to North America was being manipulated by Native Americans. And uh, for example, by lighting fires to keep, keep down underbrush and resulted in these huge stands of beautiful, big, old growth. And, and so we, it, it was a mistake of the Wilderness Act not to recognize that. And, and really that sort of that um, ideal landscape that so many people want to go back to was not a landscape that was free of human interference. It was, it was at least partly the result of human influence for thousands of years. Judy, unmute what? yourself. Unmute. You can push down the space bar or you can click on the on the I mute am. Button. I'm trying. Okay. Good. We can Rick, hear you now. Um thank you. I I don't want to offend anybody, but I think dogs, big dogs and groups of dogs that people let off their leashes. It's a huge problem. 
Even when I take a little walk, a perk and crit, dogs come running, 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 because every person feels like their dog needs exercise, which their dogs do. But what should we, I don't know what to do about that. Well, it's just another example of how more and more people are turning to a scarcer and scarcer resource as an outlet for all of the constraints and annoyances and um, shortcomings of the life we inhabit on a daily basis, right? My dog can't run around at home. By golly, I'm gonna let my dog run around out in the wilderness, forgetting that there's a lot of other people out there in the wilderness. Uh, just for the record, the Forest Service rule about dogs is they do not have to be on leash, but they do have to be under control, which means that the owner should be using either voice or leash to keep the dog from annoying or annoying other people or chasing wildlife, for example. So you're right, Judy, it is a problem. Well, and dogs my, dog, don't... my dog would never hurt anybody. No, no. And dogs don't use toilet paper, but they yeah. sure poop in the trail. Absolutely. And near lakes and streams. Uh, Rick's heard me say this before, but I'm advocating that we do like a, a hunter's, hunter's permit. You have to take a class and then you get a little card. I think they still do it. Um, that I had to do when I was 15 or something, but you have wilderness permits where you have to take a class. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a few nights a week or a online something or preferably 10 weeks in a row. And then you, you get a permit and you don't get to go in unless you have your permit. Yeah. Let's use the word license instead of permit. I, Greg and I have talked about this. Uh, you know, if you think about driving and hunting, they are both activities that involve a certain amount of danger to yourself and others. They entail a certain amount of responsibility and they, they entail a certain amount of accountability. And I think all three of those apply to humans in wilderness areas. And I, I think Greg and I see very much eye to eye on this. It's uh, at, in this day and age, it probably seems like an outlandish idea, but I think it has a lot of merit and, and deserves to be explored. It's got a lot of benefits. It would be a it would be a card, just like your driver's license that you got, and you carried it on your person, and you didn't have to reapply for it every time you wanted to go for a hike. You would just have it, and you would need it in order to go into any federally designated wilderness. And it would that would guarantee that you were getting that education about leave no trace before you set foot in the wilderness. Because what's happening right now is. We're working at uh, Mirror Lake. Here's somebody camped too close to the lake. Here's somebody who pooped. Uh, here's, here's somebody who's switchbacks. We catch them in the act. We try to educate them. They change their behavior. But in the meantime, the damage has already occurred. So the, the land is losing. The, the land is still losing every day. If we can if we can educate those people before they even set foot in the wilderness, then we're going to be much better off. So I, I'm very much on Greg's uh, page with licenses. Not so really I, it makes sense. My mother, my mother went down to the drugstore and bought her first driver's license. There was no <laughs> test required. It was $2 and you bought a license. So you could make a comparable thing that, in the wilderness now, we have this wilderness check-in where you don't have to do anything but sign in or whatever to get a permit. So right. maybe it can be ramped up in the same way. Yeah. Linda? Yeah, I'm wondering about outfitters with the horse camps and what we're seeing with large quantities of crap coming in. Are, do outfitters have any responsibility or are they all private? Horse uh, I. I would say that the majority of the horse camps I have dealt with in the wilderness are private parties. There are some outfitter camps, but outfitters um, are regulated by the Forest Service and are inspected by the Forest Service. So my guess is that outfitters by and large hew to a higher standard than most private parties. I think the biggest messes that we find are private parties that um, tend to go back to the same location year after year 
and develop a proprietary sense of ownership over something that they really, yes, they own it in the same sense that we all own it. And none of us should feel like we're invading someone else's private property when we're in the wilderness. And many of these hunting camps feel like that. They're fiercely guarded and defended. So I just have a question. What about just permits? So many places are limiting how many people can go into an area. I think we've talked about this before too, but right. does that help? Well, uh, yes, it helps. There's a conundrum there. And, and this goes back to the mentality that a lot of people have. I have certainly talked to people in the backcountry who said, I would rather have a, a quota system than have all these other people camping at Mirror Lake with me. What those people are drawing on is their experience or understanding of the way things work in national parks by and large. In national parks, you know, national parks can have wilderness areas inside them. BLM lands can have wilderness, but in national parks by and large, you see, you see a, uh, the agency play a much heavy, a much more heavy handed role in management. So they might have designated campsites. You can only camp in these places. They might have quota systems. Only so many people can go to this place at this time. And uh, that means you have to register maybe in person and, or you have to send in an application weeks or months ahead of time. And when all the permits are gone, they're gone, they're out of luck. However, the force here and in most wilderness areas is trying to is trying to maintain, maintain the standard of, in the Wilderness Act of an un uh, what's it called an unconfined form of recreation. They're trying to use a light hand and not put too many rules on where you can go and when you can go. So that's honorable on the part of the Forest Service. It's just an example of how there are these competing. Uh, mandates in the Wilderness Act that mean the Forest Service has to do a juggling act. So they want to preserve the resource for future generations, but they also want, they don't want to have too many rules about how many people can come in and where you can camp. The net, the net result of that is that the resource, the land is losing. Little by little, we've got more and more worn areas that take hundreds of years to, to recover at that elevation. Um, and and you have trails that are developing deeper and deeper ruts and so forth. So uh, it, may, it may be that eventually the Forest Service does say, well, we are going to have to limit uh, entry to Lakes Basin. I have defended greater use of signage, which I think um, people, we in 2012, we finally put up signs inside the wilderness that said fires prohibited beyond this point. Uh, and that applies to a quarter mile buffer around about a dozen lakes, like Mirror Lake and Ice Lake. That rule has been in place for decades, but not until we actually put the signs up in 2012 did we start seeing a high degree of compliance. So we, not, we know from that experience that signage is actually pretty effective at educating people um, and informing them about what, what the rules of the road are. So I would, and I think that signs can be small, smaller than some of the giant ones you see and can be used judiciously and have an impact. For example, at Mirror Lake, I've been lobbying for a series of small signs that say no camping between trail and lake because that whole North Shore of Mirror Lake is where the worst and most visible impacts occur. That's under consideration, but we'll just have to see. Rick, there's another thing that came to mind. You, you uh, showed the, the backpacking magazines and all the high tech gear. Uh, there's a certain amount of elitism here. I know there's, an, there's a movement to, for instance, to try to get black people to, to, to hike. There's a whole, there, there are yeah. a group of black people that are afraid to hike yeah. because of, of conditions. And I wonder whether this is another item here that we, that we have a class thing going on and some of these some of these horse people are saying screw all you you feet uh, backpack packers this is our country we've been using it like this for years 
And are there some battles going on in that way? Uh, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty big tent. There's a lot of yeah issues and trends going on. You know, I I do think there is a certain amount of xenophobia, which just to remind us all has nothing to do with class or color, but has to do with whether you're local or not. Okay. I feel that myself. I see these people, right. you know, sailing from Portland and they're hiking along in their tennies and their little itty bitty pack and they're carrying their hammock and they're making a bunch of noise at Mirror Lake and they seem to be complete and they're making up their own names for places here. I feel that xenophobia. They can go back to Portland, you know, you're just, you're just making them, you're just creating more impacts here, right? I'm not saying I yield to that, but I can feel that impulse. So I can relate to uh, that xenophobia that longtime residents or or uh, horse packers who've been coming up here for decades and are used to doing things the old way, where you cut down a tree to make a pole for your wall tent. Tent, you know, maybe they feel a certain amount of disdain or dislike for all the hordes of backpackers up at up at Mirror Lake. Yeah, so there, that, there's definitely a current there, and it's mutual. I've talked to plenty of backpackers who see no place for horses. Uh, you know, I try to, I try to hew to a middle course there. There's no doubt in my mind that horse, horses cause a disproportionate amount of damage to the landscape. It's inevitable. They weigh a thousand pounds. They have steel on their feet. They're not very smart. They're not thinking about how do I minimize my impact. They spook easily, right? So of course they're going to create more damage. But they're also a traditional part of the Western landscape. They are also useful for enabling people to clear trails because they carry tools and gear that would be essentially impossible for people to carry themselves without the help of stock. So, you know, there, it, it cuts both ways. And how many, but how many black and brown people did you see in the wilderness this year? A handful. You know, I was going to scan up the cover and back cover of the latest Backpacker magazine because it has a person of color on the front and the ad on the back also features a person of color. And if you look at REI catalogs and so forth, my guess is that people of color are generally overrepresented in those catalogs and I think that's because those manufacturers want to demonstrate that they have um, I don't know if credibility is the right word but they want to show that they're on the right side of the fence right mm -hmm. so and I think that's I think you see that in other sorts of publications as well I think that as we get more and more urban people in the wilderness, you're going to see greater diversity, which I think is wonderful. Well, how, much Rick, is, I... how much of it is a class thing? I'm not sure. I mean, one of the reasons people are opposed to a tax on backpacking gear is for reasons of economic disparity, right? They don't want to make it more expensive for people who are lower income. That's another reason in favor of licenses versus a, a tax on outdoor gear. For one thing, you don't know if someone buys a tent, whether they're using it to go into the wilderness or whether they're using it to camp in their backyard, right? But if you have a license that a person gets specifically because they want to recreate in the wilderness, then you're charging somebody and asking them to go through a process that is very specifically targeted to a particular locale and, and activity. Well, it's almost 1.30. That was a great presentation, Rick. Um, I thank you very much. And uh, if people have, want to continue the conversation, uh, the, the chat box will close now, so take a look at, it, at that. But um, we, we, can, uh, we can email around if you want to continue the conversation. And if there are other places that you say where, see, that you know where Rick can make this, uh, this kind of a presentation, we ought to spread it around. Thank you, Rich, and everybody else. Rick, will there be a recording posted, a link to a recording posted? We will post it, yeah. There's Cheryl. She's back. <laughs>
Yeah, we'll post a link to the recording. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Say bye-bye, Momo. Bye. And you and Momo get a $25 gift certificate at the Josephi Center Art Shop, Mr. Okay. Bombachi. Thank you.